something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. But one of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam. Hello and welcome to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Ado, uh, your thought leadership program that brings you uh, nuggets of insights from the lives and uh, work of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of either starting their own business or managing and growing institutions right here at home and around the world. Uh, my guest today on the show is a, a celebrated uh, plastic surgeon uh, born right here in Ghana, uh, emigrated to the United States, uh, trained at Harvard and uh, has uh, been touted as the surgeon's surgeon, um, lots of awards. We're going to get to meet Dr. Michael Obin. He's the founder of um, Restore, which is a medical outreach program which has been going on for uh, about 11 years and also um, Miko Plastic Surgery Center in the zip code 90210, Beverly Hills, United States, well, New York. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure is all mine. You know, and um, I'm sure well, before we start having real serious conversations, you know, the um, TV show 90210, um, you know, have always been something that's been um, touted as a, a program that showed the glamorous side of uh, Beverly Hills. And um, it's become synonymous with looking fab and glam. Is that what it's all about? Absolutely. You know, the, the zip code 90210 is one of the most uh, celebrated zip codes. It's one of the most expensive zip codes, one of the most exclusive zip codes. And uh, yes, it doesn't fail. It doesn't disappoint. And uh, it's all what it's said to be, and even more. Um, for those of your viewers who have been to Beverly Hills, of course, um, it has a feel. It's very different. It's very laid back. It doesn't compare to New York. It doesn't compare to Paris. It has its own identity. Mm. And that identity is synonymous with glam, with wealth, with ostent you know, uh, ostentatiousness, and uh, with beauty. Mm. And, uh, you know, and it's one of the most expensive zip codes to operate any office, mm. and one of the most expensive zip codes to have uh, resident, so it is what it is. It is, okay. and how much of that factored into you moving yeah. your practice there? Yeah, you know, it wasn't part of the plan. Um, you know, I started my career of as a, as a chief of plastic surgery at a, a smaller hospital in Ohio, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, right after I left Harvard, I was recruited uh, to be the chief of plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. They were looking for a microsurgeon, which is a skill that I had acquired when I was at Harvard. And um, at the time, this town, Youngstown, I don't know if it's not a big town, it's, it's sandwiched between Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Okay. And Youngstown uh, was notorious for a mob destination. So apparently, Youngstown is the uh, half midway point between New York City and Chicago. Right. And during the, the height of the mob, the mafia, uh, you know, they use Youngstown a lot. So they have a lot of members uh, in Youngstown. Mm -hmm. And Youngstown is predominantly Italian and Greek. And um, so they had a bad rep. But uh, just to go there, to a town between you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and they did not have about 100,000 people. They did not have a plastic surgeon who, was, uh, who had the ability to do microsurgery. So they recruited me. I spent time there. And um, it got to a point when I said, you know what? When it's all said and done, I want to do restore work. Okay? And for me to do restore, I need a bigger stage. Mm. I did not like Washington, D.C. I did not like New York. I didn't like Texas, anyway, Houston or Dallas, and I didn't like Miami. So the obvious choice was Los Angeles. But I never in my wildest dream that I wanted to move my practice to Beverly Hills. It was just a stroke of luck. I was looking for an office space, and I looked through a magazine, and this guy was looking for uh, office sharing. 
because he couldn't afford to, uh, the, rents are so, the rent is so expensive. And he wanted somebody to defray the cost of his overhead. So going through my journals, I came across him, I called him, and that's why I got to Beverly Hills. I called, I went to look at his office, and uh, we went back and forth, and later he said, oh, he's not available anymore. At that time, I did not know much about Los Angeles, so I kept looking. So he connected me with a realtor who happened uh, to know the real estate market, you know, for commercial real estate in Beverly Hills. So they found me that place, and I saw it, I loved it, and we signed the lease, and now he's eight years and still going stronger. So that's how I got to Beverly Hills. Interesting story. Um, I know in the beginning, I think I made a, uh, a mistake um, pointing people in the wrong direction. Um, the coolest part of uh, New York is Manhattan. So Beverly Hills is oh, the, the coolest, is the, the coolest is part of uh, um, Los Angeles, <laughs> or, so, or Southern California. That's right. You know. yeah. so, um, um, so you made this decision that for what you intend doing, you need to be on a bigger stage. Bigger stage. Yeah. And um, so how did you know that you had something special and, and, and it did require you know, uh, you know, I always say something special. I've always felt blessed. Um, you know, my story has been one, one story of grace, and uh, you know, it's, it's been a fairy tale. And um, I've always known that I was destined for greatness. Uh, but of course, it was in my wildest dream that that I'll be a very well celebrated plastic surgeon in Beverly, in the heart of the, the world, which is Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And but uh, I've always had the penchant for charity. Uh, this is something my grandmother instilled in us. You know, my grandmother was not the wealthiest, was not the poorest, but always had something to give to the poor, mm -hmm. or somebody who was less fortunate than us. And when I started Restore, you know, it was something that, growing up in Ghana, knowing that, hey, you know what, all these little children that were born, that, that have been born, that we used to, I don't know if they still, they still call them, in Shuba. Mm -hmm. You know, they make the river babies, they came from the river, there's somebody behind it, there's some bad spirits, and let's get rid of them. We saw that growing up. You know, I grew up in Ghana in the 70s and 80s, and we saw that. So, having had the opportunity to, to study medicine, having had the opportunity to, to study, you know, plastic surgery, knowing that these are things that are freaks of nature in terms of developmental stages where things are not aligned properly get things on fire properly. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with the person, their families, and things like this. So these are the same phenomena that happen in the Western world. It happens in America, in Europe, in Asia. So having acquired those type of skills, I say, you know what, I want to go back to God and help. And the formation of Restore was something that I woke up one night, I just came from, I said, this is what it's supposed to be called, Restore. Of course, you know, it, it dates back to 1984-85 when our Operation Smart came to Ghana and I had the opportunity to witness firsthand how plastic surgery can change an individual. And I always tell the story about how a neighbor of mine, uh, a neighbor of mine uh, had acid porn in her face, okay? She was disfigured, she became a recluse. She did not want to leave her house until Operation Smile came and did surgery on her. He changed her. She came out, she was happy, and at that early age, I knew I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. It was about 13, 14, 15, I could know. But, uh, but so, knowing that this is what I wanted to do, having acquired the, the necessary set of skills, and I talked to myself and told myself, and I want to go to the biggest stage so I can raise enough money, because mm -hmm. that's what makes me happy. It makes me happier than doing boobs and you know doing cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. Cosmetic surgery is just a small part of what I do. But uh, what really makes me happy, what really fills my tank and fuels me, is giving back through the power of reconstructive surgery. Fantastic stuff. So, um, Michael, the desire to give back was something that you sort of was birthed very early in you. Um, and you mentioned earlier that your story is one of a grace-laden uh, life. Yes. Um, let's dwell a little bit on <laughs> why you, you, you say, you say it's, a, it's a journey of grace. It's, a, it's, it's been a journey of grace. You know, uh, I was born in Ashtown. I don't know if for those of Kumasi. you. Kumasi. I was well, I'm a Kumasi boy. I was born in Ashtown. I grew up 
uh, or 81, right in the middle of Ashtown, not too far from Afia Line. There was a place called Afia Line. That was where all the gangsters mm -hmm. used to hang out. Uh, but we grew up there. You know, we thrived. We, we did well. Um, I, I did not like school as a child. I used to cut class for first grade. What well, first grade to cut class? I, I just didn't like school. So I would go in the morning, like, I would go, I leave home, and I didn't want to go to school. I, I remember vividly, I would go to, um, they had a playground. I went to Kill Methodist, mm -hmm. okay? I went to a playground. It was a playground where they would do magic, they would bring the monkeys. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that was what excited me. And I used to go and watch it in the morning. I wouldn't go out and I would sit on a tree. You know, I did not start liking school until second grade. Wow. P2. We would call it P2. And that's when I knew I was intelligent. I was more intelligent than the average person in my class. Uh, second grade, I was doing about fifth or seventh grade math. Uh, okay. I, I like math so much. and. I, I thank my teachers uh, for, for challenging me at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And I've always been good at math. But fast forward, it's just, you know, I had the opportunity to go to, uh, you know, we, we moved, my uncle had built uh, a house in Ahonju. Mm -hmm. So my uncle moved my grandmother to Ahonju and we, the whole family followed, followed suit. Uh, then I changed schools. I went to Inchesu International School. And, uh, you know, all this time, you know, we never had a lot of money, okay? We, I always said that we're not poor. You know, we never said we're poor. But we have more than the average Ghanaian, I think. Uh, we had a lot of love. My grandmother, you know, doted on me all the time. And, um, you know, fast forward, I had the opportunity to go to Pembroke College where, you know, my uncle pretty much raised me. My dad was not much into my life until later, you know, so. I was always at the graves of my uncle and you know aunts and you know everybody chipping in. It took a whole village, mm -hmm. and, um, and that was it. You know, and then I decided I don't want to be in Ghana. I don't want to stay in Ghana. I wanted to go to America. So, and of course, you know, people would make fun of you. They laugh. It's, it's just has been an incredible story. I mean, there were times you make a list of things and you give it to your uncle, and he will cross it out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he will cross it out. And, you know, you wear the same. Pair of, the same pair of shorts, and you know you get holes in it. You know how you wear a shirt That's because right. your your bones, you know, sticks on it. And with due time, mm -hmm. pressure, you get wears out and it wears out and have those holes. Yeah. And well, I remember my grandmother used to patch them up, and kids would still make fun of you. They would put your finger in it. You know, so we went through that. You know, I was one of those children, and um, you know, lo and behold, I had the opportunity. You know, one thing I knew that I was good at was I was very good in school. So I honed in. I honed in on those. Uh, the, the gift that God has given me. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to stay in Ghana and go to school because I knew that there were, there were great opportunities uh, in America. Mm -hmm. And this all stems from a book I read. It's called The Smell of Onions. It's by a Nigerian author where I remember one paragraph it talks about America is the land that flows with milk and honey. And uh, I wanted to go and taste that milk and honey. I wanted to go and, uh, you know, have an equal playing field. I, f I always felt like it's better. Mm -hmm. Uh, because back then, and it's still the same, a lot of the countries, uh, for you to ascend to the top, you have to know people. You have to be very connected. We were not from that type of family that was so connected that will have those breaks. And I wanted to take the, uh, the, uh, the journey in my hands and in God's hands and I left. And even going to school in America, it was also a stroke of luck. Um, Yes, I, I was intelligent enough, I was smart enough to be able to do well on the SAT uh, to get an I-20. You know? But when I left Ghana, I did not even have a scholarship. Okay, the tuition was $15,000. Okay, nobody in my family had $15,000 at the time. Okay, uh, my friend of mine's father gave me a, ba a bank statement for me to be able to send to the school to get a visa. I mean, to get the I-20. I That's got the right. I-20. Another friend of mine had to give me uh, another bank statement that we had to work on it ourselves and send it to the embassy. So all these things, you know, I mean, it came down to the wire when the embassy said, okay, for us to give you a visa, everything checks out. But the bank is not, it wasn't your big banks like the Barclays, the Merchant, mm -hmm. the Standard Chartered. It was a small bank called Inswatri Mine. Rural, Rural bank. bank. Okay. okay. At the time, I didn't even know what Inswatri was, you know. Yeah, I might have a bank statement for mm -hmm. Inswatri, you know, and the embassy back then, there was no, <laughs> there was no Wi-Fi. There was no internet, and you know there was no electronic communication. And you have to physically mail things, and you just imagine what in Swati was what in the Bronx region. That's right. You know, just to get here, and I kept coming back to Accra. 
I never spent any time in Accra. I came only to get a visa at one purpose. <laughs> and I had to make a trip to him, so I had to go find out why the verification was taking so long. And I finally, you know, they sent it. And I, it was right on the wire. I think I got a visa, I think four or five days before orientation. Wow. Which means I had to leave. Even when it came down to a ticket, uh, my, one of my uncles had promised me to buy my ticket uh, if, I, if I were to get a visa. And after that, he said, you know, I only have this amount. I took it, I thanked him, you know, and he was very nice. But I was still short of my $340. I had to go to Mr. Darko from Darko Farms, who lived across from my house. And I told him, I said, and actually I didn't tell him the whole truth, I told him I have a scholarship, I didn't have a scholarship. And he took the money, you know, he called uh, his office and I cried, and they bought a ticket for 1340 So he had about $340. I came to America, I had about 100, less than 200 I think I left Ghana with $200 in my pocket. Stopped in London, we, we stopped from, it was a BA, from here to Gatwick. And I got Gary, got first, I tasted my first McDonald's. I spent about <laughs> seven pounds and 49 uh, peas. And then from there we took a bus to Heathrow and then Heathrow to Dallas, Washington. So it just has been something that has been real for me. And to go there, to go to America not having a scholarship, but with just pure determination mm. that I'm gonna make it, um, I didn't know how I was gonna pay. And but you know, I have concocted my own, in my own madness, I said, okay, I can go to America, work, save 15,000, go to school. <laughs> but you know, when, you, when you're a child, you know, and now time I was 19, about to turn 20, you feel like you're a superman, you, mm -hmm. you know, and I really feel like I can do anything. But I just did the math. I said, okay, I'll go to America, I'll work 20 hours a day, okay, I'll sleep four hours, every day I'll make $100, I'll make $700 a week, mm -hmm. 2800 a month, but and in no time, you'll catch yeah, you'll, you'll get to and I 15. did it in 2000, so 15, I needed about six months. So my whole goal, I knew that I was hard to, hard to defer. And I knew that I was going to make about, you know, but you don't think that there's something called taxes, you mm -hmm. got to pay rent, mm -hmm. you got to eat. But, you know, all these, you know, I, I was so determined. I, you know, th none of those things came into the equation. And then having to go, you know, having to have the opportunity to go. And now I realize that 15,000, even for the average American, was not possible. But I, got, I, I, kept, I kept catching breaks. I kept catching breaks. I remember when I arrived, I arrived in America on August 21st, 1993. Of course, I knew I, wasn't going, I didn't have money to go to school. You know? And then I called the school that Monday, and I said, I arrived, I arrived late. I'm not going to be able to make it. I want, I want to defer it to the spring. I said, no problem. So the thing is, everything I ask, you got I, I got it. Okay? And then... For me to get a visa, of course, I had to convince the American Embassy that, okay, I'm going to go study agriculture engineering. My father has a farm in Sunyane, and I'm going to come and work for my father because you have to meet criteria. The four different criteria. You have to have a purpose. The purpose mm -hmm. was to go to school. <coughs> uh, number two, you have to have the means. I have the bank statement to show that I had the means. Number three, uh, you have to... Oh, number two, that whatever you were studying, at the time, like whatever you were studying uh, has to be something that's not offered in Ghana. Mm. And that's why I chose agriculture engineering, because at the time, agriculture engineering was not popular. Now, everybody here at Tech and uh, studied mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, so I had to come out with agriculture engineering. Then when I got to America, I changed it. I said, um, you know, my father said, and I changed it from agriculture engineering, so I deferred it. I deferred it to the, the spring, the spring, just to buy me time. And then after I deferred it, I also um, called me a week later. I said, because, you know, I want to change my major. So I changed from agriculture engineering to chemistry. Then a week later, I called back. I said, because I changed it, my father is not going to pay my tuition. He said, Can you guys help me? Okay, there was a lady named Susan Merkel. Susan was so nice. Sue Merkel, we still keep in touch. She said, Let me look at your grades. Let me see what I can do for you. That's why I say it's always been God, 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 God. Susan comes back to me and says, you know what, you, your grades are good enough to get a scholarship. Why don't we do this? I'm going to get you in-house, I mean in-state, I mean $500. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the state of Texas had a law that anybody who is receiving over $500 worth of scholarship mm -hmm. or grants automatically qualifies for in-state tuition. Okay. Okay. So now that I dropped my bread in from 15000 to about 2000 and change. Mm -hmm. Now it was attainable, so now I had a goal to work to be able to save 2,000 in four months, okay? 
Um, and I've never been afraid of work. You know, that's one thing that my uncle instilled in me because at a young age, I was washing cars at 12. Mm. Kid, our kids don't do nothing these days. <laughs> I had to sweep the house every morning before I went to school. That's right. So hard work was easy for me because I have been doing it for so long. So now here we are. My burden has been decreased from 15,000 to about 2,000 and change or 2,700. Mm. Um, I got a job right away. I arrived on the 21st. I was working my first week in September. Wow. Okay, I work at a bakery, a Mediterranean bakery. I worked there about a week or two later. I got a second job working at a, a Sierra, Le Sierra Leonean grocery store, African grocery store owned by a Sierra Leonean. I worked there, and uh, it was one of those jobs that I would never have done it if it was in Ghana because I hated meat. I didn't like meat. Even my grandmother, as much as I love my grandmother, I used to dodge her. I used to not want to go to what do you call it? Mayanka, the the what do you call that place? There? Oh, uh, the the where they, where the the abattoir. Yeah, yeah. You know they call it Kumasi. They call it Mayanka. So okay. the abattoir. So I didn't want to go. In. My grandmother was my favorite person in my life, and for her to send me, I didn't want to go. And I was the last resort. You know, if there was nobody there, then I would go. And I did not eat meat growing up. Okay, I only ate chicken. Of course, the only ate meat I ate was pork. Mm -hmm and fish. And here am I working at an African grocery store and my job was to cut meat. Wow. Okay, touching meat. And I remember a lady one day you know, brought tears to my eyes, you know, and uh, she was a Ghanaian lady. She came in and and uh, she looks at me and said, I ran to your home for the you my way to This is my card. Call me, I'll find you a better job. You know, that day it brought tears to my eyes. But you know, I knew I had the goal and I had a vision and the purpose, I needed money, and I was going to do whatever it took legally mm -hmm. to get money. So I worked there, so I would work at the bakery, and I would go to, um, I would go to the grocery, the African grocery store and cut a meat. Mm -hmm. And then I got a third job. So I work, I would start my day by six, I would leave my house at six. And all these jobs were, was walking distance from where I lived. Okay. So I didn't have to drive. So I walked to the bakery in the morning, like six, I leave my house, and then walked there. I, I stayed with my cousin, you know, my, um, Mom's older sister's daughter. You know, in Ghana, we call my sister. Right. So I stayed with her when I got to Washington, and um, I would leave the house at six, six fifteen. I'm at work at six thirty. That's when I had to clock in, and I worked to about two thirty, three o'clock. And from there, I walked to the grocery store. And then I stopped four o'clock. Chop up meat till about nine thirty. Then nine thirty, I'll get food. I'll eat there. Then from there, I will just take the bus and go all the way to. Uh, on top of SO Road to uh, one of the warehouses where all the trucks will bring all the, the, um, the things for, for the malls. Okay. And my job was to sort them out. So, oh, so you're working in a, a logistics uh, warehouse? Yeah. So mm -hmm. sort them out, and I did that for about a week, and I got sick because I was not getting home until about 2 in the morning. So for, for like 10 days, I was only sleeping. Like I said, I was working 20 hours. 20 hours, you yeah. Know? Yeah, it was a reality. And then my cousin and my sister I was like, you're going to kill yourself, stop. So I stopped there, I quit the third job. And then I was able to, you know, save enough money. And on December 30th, I got on the bus, Greyhound bus, from Washington, D.C. to Wichita Falls, Texas. And the rest has been history. Fantastic story. I mean, it's, it, I'm sure there's a lot more we can there's we can lean more, from yeah. that. But uh, we're going to take our very first break. Sure. And uh, when we come back, um, we'll explore... Um, the world of medicine, you know, um, uh, and, and the comparative analysis of what you remember of Ghana's healthcare system and what you saw in America, and some lessons we can learn. Sure. Super. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is the Executive Lounge. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. Uh, I'm Inshira Addo, and uh, my guest today is Dr. Michael Obing. He's a celebrated uh, plastic surgeon, one of our own, born, grew up here in Ghana, emigrated to the United States in 1993, and as they say, the rest is history. Um, Michael, it's interesting that in, in the first part you talked about how the medical uh, outreach by uh, Operation Smile improved the, um, how do you call this? The quality, the, the quality of life um, and, and the, and the self-esteem of, self of, 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 of this 
the shoulder of the, uh, yours who had been uh, burned by uh, acid. acid yeah. um, and at the time, it looked as though without that outreach, there was no way she was going to get any help. That's correct. Um, if you look back at Ghana at that time and the healthcare system we had, what we have now, and what you've been exposed to on your sure. travels, what would you say would be the key foundations or pillars we must look to improve on our own health healthcare system? Thank you very much for your question. And this is a very passionate subject that I like to talk about it. Not only am I a plastic surgeon, and not only I run a charity, I also have a consulting firm. Okay. That was born out of me traveling through my charity you know, to developing countries. Uh, one thing I found, and I'm going to talk in general terms before I specifically talk about Ghana. Mm -hmm. One of the common denominators when we traveled all over, okay, going to developing countries over the last decade, was the need for healthcare infrastructure in most places. Most of the places I visited, they had the hospitals, the operating rooms, mm -hmm. uh, operating rooms that would never pass the tests. Okay, in any developed country. I've, I've said it and I'll say it again, I would not even do surgery on my dog in some of these facilities. It's how horrible and how deplorable some of these areas look. I mean, operating rooms look. So, one of the biggest concerns for most volunteers when they traveled was the fact that they prayed that they did not want to get sick. They did not want to get sick because of obvious, obvious reasons. Most of these hospitals did not have basic supplies, okay, even oxygen, you know, and it's sad. It should not happen like that, okay? And Ghana is no different. You know, we've all heard stories about people dying, the likes of PV or VIN dying because of oxygen, okay? I've had a personal friend who's like a brother to me, lost his mother-in-law because they flew from San Francisco. They came here. She couldn't breathe. I think 37 or age. They went up there and said, go buy oxygen. Why is a nation, a nation that we are so proud of ourselves and all the things that we do, can, don't even have oxygen in hospitals, okay? So coming back to Ghana specifically, and I can talk about different countries that I've had access to. Mm -hmm. The problem is education, okay? We don't put emphasis on healthcare, okay? Our priorities are displaced. Our priorities are just all over the place, not on the important things that builds nations like healthcare, education, okay? I've always had a friend believe that you know a healthy nation is a wealthy nation mm. when people are healthy they can contribute they can work hard and all that contributes to the gdp you know but without education it's not like we're poor okay we have money for everything we have money to go play soccer okay it doesn't cost much i just left vra vra hospital yesterday and they don't have a mammography machine there. it's not the first place uh, we did admissions in 2011 in Tamale. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tamale, the whole regional hospital that draws from about at least about a million people that feeds into the hospital did not have a single dialysis machine. I can go on and on and on, wow. and it's sad that a country mm -hmm. like Ghana, as advanced as we are, okay, we don't have put emphasis on healthcare, and it's because of the case. It's not because we don't have the money. We have the money. A dialysis machine is not expensive. The whole town of Tamale back in 2011 did not have a mammography machine. Okay. Yesterday I was in Akwemu, I went to VRA. That area, they have a breast care center. They don't have a mammography machine. How do you have a breast care center without a mammogram? Exactly. You know, you still, I mean, and it's not that, and I'm not singling them out. <clears throat> and how much is a mammography machine? $20,000? You tell me, so this goes to tell you where our emphasis are, okay? And I think until we as a nation start talking about healthcare, and you know, and people don't realize that now that the world has become such a small global village, Okay, investors' confidence are not there. I would not do a business where I, I, I can't live in a place where when I'm sick, I don't feel like I'm going to get good health care. So, you know, this goes to tell you. So, health care in Ghana is far behind. Okay, the doctors are very smart. They are capable. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the equipment. And, of course, you know, we as a nation need to do much better. We can do better. We've done it. We've done it in other sectors. But health care is still lacking. And so we start paying attention to a healthcare always lack, and we'll be behind. You talked about <coughs> education. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I'm guessing this is not about formal education. No, this is like ed educating people about it. Yeah. You know, educating our leaders. So it, it goes, you know, and and I think maybe we should hold our, our elected officials accountable. Um, of course, you know, it shouldn't be free, but, you know, it should be subsidized in a way. Um, you know, VRA, VRA has money. You know, of course, I guess their budget has been, has been uh, uh, cut. But ed educating people, educating people that, you know what, take better care of yourself. Educating people, go to get help. But, you know, these people are complaining when they go, they can't even get help. People, we've, seen, we've heard the stories about people delivering babies and they sleep on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, so we need to educate our leaders that healthcare is important. Healthcare is very important because these same people are the people who holds the future of this great country. And that's what I talk about education. It's not formal education, okay. but educating people about healthcare, the importance of healthcare, and the the lack of healthcare, adequate healthcare, mm -hmm. what it can, the consequences it can lead to. And they don't realize that you know I would do business, and that's why people, countries like South Africa they've done so well because they have they, you know they they are they are a developed country in terms of every every aspect of their of their sector. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare is great there. That's why we. Most African countries, most people in Africa, when they need healthcare and they can't go to Europe or the Americans, where do they go? South Africa, you know. And they got operated upon uh, by Ghanaian doctors. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we've all heard the stories of how, you know, there are more Ghanaian doctors in New York than Ghana itself. Yeah. You know, but we need to do a better job because if we don't do it, we're going to lose the great minds in this country, and and it's sad. You know, I heard people left VRA because they were so frustrated with the system. And the red tape is too much. You know, we need to reduce the red So in your opinion, um, we can turn things around if we improve the pillar of education and uh, the focus of, on, on healthcare. Right. Um, healthcare infrastructure, um, you say a dialysis machine is not that expensive. No, it's not. Um, yeah, $20,000. Um, $20,000 for a community. Yeah. This is for a teaching hospital, a regional hospital. You know, people were leaving Tamale, and mm -hmm. I don't know the situation now. They, I asked them, well, how do you guys get dialysis? They said, we have to go to Accra or Kumase. Wow. And most dialysis patients, most renal patients or kidney failure patients, they need to have dialysis at least three times a week. How many people can afford to come down here? And they built a stadium. You know, our priorities are displaced. Okay, and they're telling me how they built a stadium for the African Cup of Nations, mm -hmm. well, they were supposed to in Ghana That's in right, 2008. Mm -hmm. They built a stadium, I asked how much was the budget, this, you know, I don't know, I don't know how accurate that is, $25 million. Do we really need a stadium to kick one soccer ball? That $25 million can go a long way, okay, by improving, you know, we don't have to show the Western world that we can build stadiums, we can build these things. Okay, why don't we go home and build a hospital, buy equipment so our doctors will have things, so the patients can have quality of health, better quality of health. And that's when I talk about education. Mm. Okay, How often is that stadium being used? How often? 25 million, they're sunk to the ground, gone. And that requires... Um, then that's what I talk about education. Yeah. yeah. So there has to be education, both vertical and horizontal. You know, at, at the policy level, people have to understand the importance of healthcare, yes. a healthcare system that works, that keeps the people healthy, um, and improve the quality of their life, because that feeds into the economy. That's correct. Um, people also have to learn how to take care of themselves. Of themselves. You know. um, yeah. And I've always, I'm sorry to cut you, I get so passionate about it, and I get angry, and you talk about the, the, the media, mm -hmm. okay? I've always have been of the belief that I think all the media houses <coughs> should allocate at least one hour. Before you get your license, you have to sign the MOU of the government. Like one hour is for health education. Mm. Okay. I remember one time, I'm in a taxi, and it talks so much about sex, 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 how to have better sex, it was a whole co-host, a man and a woman. And I thought it was inappropriate because it was prime time, about between six and eight. I was mm -hmm. coming from... And children listen to it, you know, but it was just the the uh, the gravity of it and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the profanity of it, okay? And some of these same stations can use one hour, you know, I don't know what day of the week, Sundays, mm -hmm. when people talk about, pick up the same disease that are killing, 
you know, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. diabetes, educate people, you know, tell them what to look for. You know, why not work for every station? I think people will be aware that, hey, you know what, it's not the witches that are killing us. We're killing ourselves mm. because we don't take better care of ourselves. You know, learn what to ask to doctor. And doctors get upset in, in this town. We're just having this conversation. When you ask them questions, when you ask them, you know, mm -hmm. why am I taking this medication? And they say, you know, we are two no two no. You know, they, these are some of the mentality. Like, so the, the education goes for everybody. It goes to the, the policy makers, it goes to the doctors, mm -hmm. it goes to the patient, the media houses that we can all learn about how to be healthy, how, what questions to ask when we go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If we do all these little things, we'll be, you know, we'll be healthy. When we are healthy, we work harder, and we'll be wealthy. You know, you mentioned um, that it's important that we focus on putting the right equipment and, and putting money where it should go. And yes. healthcare is, is critical. Okay. Um, I think in Ghana um, or, or Africa um, accounts for what, 16 or more percent of um, the global population. Mm -hmm. Uh, yet we're spending about a percentage of Less our than GDP a percent on health care. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, in Ghana, I want your thoughts on our own system. So we're very centered, you know, um, and it's not a federal state, you know, um, or a federation like the U.S. Um, so the center, which is executive government, runs the country. Correct. Um, which means that there is a Ghana Health Service, which reports to the Ministry of Health, the Minister reports to well, the Minister is the President's uh, representative. How can we make that structure more efficient so that there's better focus on what ought to be done and done properly in the interest of people living better lives? I think there are so many people in between the systems and you know that was the frustration about VR even procurement you have to go through you know they should just decentralize it so that hospitals can take better care of themselves they have a budget okay they report to somebody but the whole system I don't know the whole system to speak effectively on it but I think it's too cumbersome the little that I have seen I think it's a little too cumbersome and it needs to be decentralized so that people can make better decisions and also be held accountable Okay, I remember having conversations like this with uh, the CEO of, uh, of Confonoche. You know, they talk about how the budget has been slashed, and I was trying to tell them how to raise money for themselves. And, you know, we talk about the great institutions like the Johns Hopkins Hospital, mm -hmm. the Harvard Hospital where I worked, the Mass General Hospital. Okay, those institutions did not become great on their own. People in the community, that's why I talk about education, people in the community, Okay, there are so many wealthy people. How many cars can you drive? Mm. How many homes can you own? Okay, and in the middle of the night, if you can't breathe, you're gonna die. You go to Confonochi right now, in a car accident, serious car accident, you're gonna die. Lego, I mean, uh, Colibu, you're gonna die. 37, okay? So the so-called wealthy people who is, you know, who has amassed so much wealth and they don't give back to the systems. There are enough wealthy people to build centers of excellence in every capital city in this country and you agree with me okay but they expect okay in the middle of the night, they think that their wealth can get them to london when they can't breathe mm -hmm. when you are having a stroke or heart attack you have a two hour window two hour window i don't care how much you are worth i don't care how don't rich you that. are okay by the time you get your private jet you summons your your pilot your crew you're not going to make it to SA. You're not going to make it to Johannesburg. You're not going to make it to London. You're going to die, and we've seen it. Okay, so just imagine if these people will put money into their own background and build better facilities. No benefit okay. too. Yeah, better facilities that they can enjoy when they are sick. You know, even the president. You know, these they don't. We don't have enough. You know, good enough infrastructure. To, to sustain some of these. And I think if individuals start thinking about building better structures, you'll also burden, you know, ease the burden on the Ghana Health Services, okay? I don't know how the system works, but I think there's also too much bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy has to be cut. Individuals have to be encouraged mm -hmm. to build better system for themselves. How do you encourage people in a society where... Education. <laughs> where we're not very... Given. 
to charity. I think we are giving. To you know, I mean, you, you can't have the, the tag of but, having great hospitality if you don't have the heart of giving. But, but we don't show our wealth. Oh, we do show our wealth. We, we do? Of course. They show their wealth by buying bigger cars and bigger houses. <laughs> they show wealth. Well, they, the so-called big men, they call them big men. You mm. don't see a big man when you see one. Okay? I hope every big man will put money into a system to encourage. Look at what the maternity ward that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's enough money in Ghana. We don't have to go to the World Bank to get money. If every rich person donated $100,000, okay, over time, not yeah. a one-time period, some people can do more. You can raise, I'm, I'm telling you, you can raise in excess of $20, 30000000 million just to, to help your own self. You know, and they don't think about This is what I talk about education. And some of my friends that I know that are wealthy, I tell them this all the time. And some are now starting to change their mindset because, you know, they love this country. We all love this country. Why do you want to go and get a checkup in a hospital in New York by a Ghanaian doctor and pay 10 times? When you okay? can do. And then guess yeah. what? You don't have that luxury when you are dying, when you can't breathe, when you don't have oxygen. And this is not just Ghana. I'm here. I'm. I'm in Congo, with the. I remember when Congo hosted the, uh, the African Games. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of the presidents' son took me. This is the Republic of Congo. Took me to show me the Olympic Stadium and how proud they were to have spent about almost one billion dollars. And I go to the military hospital. There is not a ventilator. Okay, there is not oxygen. And I tell you, did you know that, you know, after you finish all drinking all this champagne, you go to this hospital, you're going to die, there's no accidents. What do you mean? Sometimes they don't even know. So here you are showing me all the wealth, but you don't have oxygen. How much is oxygen? $100 less? Okay, so this is the education I talk about. And it's sad. It's sad how we think, mm -hmm. how we process, you know, uh, how, how we, we allocate our wealth. How much are you going to take with you when you die, when you can't breathe? You mm -hmm. know, this is just simple questions that we all have to ask ourselves. Interesting thoughts. Uh, we're going to take our final break, uh, and then when we come back, uh, we'll hear some more from my guest, uh, Dr. Michael Obing, uh, founder of Miko Plastic uh, Surgery Center in uh, Beverly Hills. This is the Executive Lounge. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. Uh, I'm in Shirado. My guest is uh, Dr. Michael Obing, and uh, he's a celebrated plastic surgeon, uh, a man who's passionate about uh, his home country, Ghana. And so he's been, since 2008, uh, leading a team uh, of uh, medical professionals coming home to uh, provide reconstructive uh, surgery for people who can't afford uh, but do need it desperately. Um, and it takes me to the subject matter of philanthropy, you know. Um, I think that as a people we're giving um, in the sense of we're nice, um, we'll reach out and help you, but we don't like to put our hands in our pocket and help other people. You, know, you said earlier, the people buy big cars, build lots of houses. <laughs> And they show up when it's funeral time. That's right. But, but in terms of <laughs> philanthropy, I mean, is, is this something that requires some cognitive reorientation to get that done? I mean, it, 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 or you think that inherently there are people who are more giving of their substance than others? I like your choice of words, cognitively, inherently. Mm. Yes, they need to be changed. I think inherently we are not that we were not trained that way. You know. Growing up here, the only philanthropy I see people do, of course, there are good people who would take over the streets. You know, yeah. There were good people who were good to me. Uh, but when it comes to actual for people taking up causes that they feel passionate about, that they support, mm -hmm. it's not that commonplace here in our society. Yes, when you look at funeral donations, it's, it's, it's a form of philanthropy. But you know, we have been ingrained to show up when people die and that's when the bidding goes on. They tell, tell who is bigger than you, how much money you can contribute. This is the same retraining that we have to do to causes that affects our society. Mm. You know, I'm not a big fan believer in that. And, and I've always tell my friend when I die, 
don't waste your money. Give the money to charity. I just don't want a big funeral. Nothing. Sometimes just we want to be brave. Just bring me and just spread my ashes wherever. Mm -hmm. All the places I've lived. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a global citizen. But I think, yes, we need to learn how to give. We need to learn the same thing that we've been conditioned to give at funerals. We need to do that. You know, and I don't know how much of a, how much of a role the media can play. You know, I tell my friends, I, I tell my friends, and one of my good friends here in town, y'all watch it, and y'all has been graciously donating to Restore, and I'm so proud of him. You know, it did not take a lot of convincing. Uh, he sponsored a Restore trip about two years ago, and every year he gives so that the people that we touch, you know, can get the best and the maximum benefits of it. And people need to take suit that, you know, you can afford it. I mean, and these these are causes dear to people's heart. Of course, people like to show off when, 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 when the spotlight is yeah, on. When huh? the spotlight is on. <laughs> but when behind closed doors, and there are some silent givers out there. But you know, I just wish that all these healthy people would learn. And I think, you know, it's about education. You know, and I educate my friends. I tell them. I tell them the importance of it. And maybe I don't know the system yet. You know, one of the things that maybe the government can also do is to stimulate donations to. Uh, charitable organizations by giving tax breaks. Okay, I don't know how the taxing system works here. You know, I've never paid taxes here because I don't earn money here. But uh, I think that will also be a stimulant. That you know what, if you were to will something, you don't have to pay. And that, you know, I think that's what the great nations like the the Americas, the uh, the, 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 the United Kingdoms have done to stimulate donations, to stimulate uh, contributions to charitable organizations. You know, but that might be a thought. Mm. So it's important that we start looking at yes. new ways yeah, of. New uh, ways, you know. uh, so, try and get people to start seeing the importance of uh, putting their hands in their pocket. Yes. Um, and then find ways to also encourage them to do so. Yes. You know. Um, and also one thing I did, you know, fundraising. Yeah. I don't know how fundraising. I've never been to a fundraiser here in Ghana. You know, I've got friends who call me and say, "Hey, we need help with the school in this village." You know, you chip in. But I think maybe. Getting people to show, and I've, I think you know the Western culture has permeated our culture, and now people can see they watch TV, they watch shows, and they see these things. But of course, it's still uh, it's still new to them. It's a novelty, and I think if we keep start doing all these things, I think that eventually will help mm -hmm. that people would you know reach into their pockets, give so that they can get their brother off the street or get, you know, better hospitals, better schools. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, you know, you see things on the internet, you know. I remember several months ago, uh, last year I saw a school up in the northern region or somewhere in Ghana where the children were going to school under a tree and they couldn't, you know, these are sad. And it's sad for a country like Ghana for pictures like that to, to float all over the internet. And we call ourselves so civilized and so uh, smart, intelligent people. We have money, okay. One, one person can write a check or donate a building for kids to go to. These are some of the little things I talk about, you know, and it frustrates me sometimes. You know, you were born here. Yes. Um, you emigrated, and um, you've done very well for yourself. We have, over um, the last four or more decades, um, really from around the 80s um, onwards, we've had lots of people leave uh, the country better themselves, they come back. I've had the opportunity of speaking to um, a number of um, people in the medical uh, field. Um, one that comes to mind is um, Dr. Hineba. Okay. Um, you know, based in Manhattan, he does complex spinal uh, work, celebrated. And it seems that people like coming back home to want to give our sons and daughters of the land are coming because they've gone out, done well, and they're bringing something up. How would you contribute, or, or someone out there watching us now, how do they do this while they're here? How can we mobilize? What do we have to do to make our presence here count, even if we didn't leave? You know, very good question. Uh, I've always said that if all of us reached out and helped somebody, the world would be a better place. Ghana would be a better place. Mm -hmm. We all are in a position to lend a hand to our brother or sister. How do we do it? 
when you see that somebody's in need, you know, you just have to reach out. Uh, you know, I, I like to talk about education, but it's, it's one of those learned behaviors. And sometimes I don't know how people feel inside, and I don't know why it's, it doesn't touch them or move them. I've had friends who refuse to give money to people because they think they would give them money, they would take it to their to the black power people and do you join your money? <laughs> <laughs> your source of money will, will, will be cut. You know, I remember one time a friend of mine, I called a friend of mine, he's African. This is not even in America. I mean, in America, but he's African. I said, you know, somebody called me. They were having issues. They couldn't pay their rent. And if I was uh, giving money, so I called a friend of mine. I said, you know what? Do me a favor. There's this person. He's like, no, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I would do it for you, but he didn't even do it. I said, why? He said, so that what, the person can cut my money source. I said, what do you mean? It's like, they take your money. But you know, it, it's some of these beliefs that needs to be, you know, dispelled. These myths. Uh, when you do good, I think God has blessed me because I, I've always looked at my brother and my sister to see how I can help. And I am a, a testament. Where well, my life is a testament of how, you know, how I give. And that's why I continue to give. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think if we reach a consensus that, you know what, well, when you do good, good comes back to you. That's the bottom line. Great yeah. stuff. Now let's talk about your trait. Um, so <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind yeah. uh, when you hear plastic surgery uh -huh. is the, of the cosmetic type, you okay. know. Um, but I realize that there's several different reasons why plastic surgery becomes important. Um, People who get hurt in accidents, sure. um, soldiers at war, um, you know, so several applications for plastic surgery. Um, and, well, the reconstructive surgery. I think that's a, 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 a more politically correct um, uh, word or descriptor for it. How can we make it more affordable? Uh, it, because the Perception is that it's expensive, and it there are is, lots of people walking around with bags. It is, it is affordable, you know. By the way, I'm so impressed. I'm very impressed with you how you have nailed down plastic surgery. You, know, you are probably the first person who have interviewed me that knows so much about plastic surgery in terms of you now plastic surgery is not all about. You know, mm -hmm. the average journalist they look up plastic surgery, or the average person, the time every time they hear plastic surgery is what they see on TV, the Kardashians, you know. Dr. Nano mm -hmm. But like you said, plastic surgery dates back, you know, before Jesus was born. And of course, it became very popular after World War II. But it all started as a reconstructive uh, part of medicine. And after World War II, you know, because of all the war injuries, plastic surgery, there was a surgeon named Gillis. Gillis took it to another level. And plastic surgery was all about reconstruction. Uh, when I was hired to go to Ohio, Okay, I was uh, I was uh, recruited as a reconstructive surgeon. I mean, you know, and the word plastic even comes from a Greek word plasticos to mold, mm -hmm. meaning to mold. You know, so yes, you are definitely you know right, but it, it's not as expensive as people say it is. Of course, cosmetic surgery is expensive. Mm -hmm. Most health insurances cover reconstructive surgery. Yes, the average price medicine is expensive in America. I don't know about Ghana; it's expensive everywhere. Okay. And uh, when you go to a very rigorous train like a plastic surgeon, they have to compensate you. And of course, the average person might not be able to afford reconstructive surgery. That's why most reconstructive surgeons work for hospitals. Mm. You know, I worked, I was recruited, I worked for a hospital for five and a half years. And for five and a half years, my practice was about 75% reconstructive surgery and 25% cosmetic surgery. And, you know, they did not even want me to do cosmetic surgery. It was a Catholic hospital, but I said, you know what? I want to practice the full realm of plastic surgery, the full, and you know, my, I was, <laughs> and I jokingly say, you know, I did three surgeons job when I worked for the hospital, mm -hmm. okay? I ran the trauma, I ran trauma, so at one point I was on call 50% of the time. But it was very lucrative because just to put my name on the call schedule, they had to pay me, mm -hmm. whether I show up or I don't show up. You know, and it was good, you know, so just by being on call, can't even pay your whole bill for the whole entire month. So I never complained. And, you know, of course, it can disrupt your lifestyle because in the middle of the night, I remember one time in the middle of my birthday party, I got called. You had to go. And I had to go. <laughs> and I left my guest in my house. I said, I got to go. But, you know, it's, um, 
it's, it's expensive. So that's how hospitals will hire you. For a Catholic hospital hire me and pay me a very good salary, you can't turn down patients. You know, patients come in, everybody, everybody who was able to go through the system had free surgery. Of course, it's not free. Somebody's paying for it. It wasn't me. It was maybe taxpayers' money, uh, third-party insurance. And the same thing with Ghana. You know, most people who go to Confort Noche and Colibu, I don't know much about Colibu, but I know much about Confort Noche. Okay. You know, the NHI's, uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme, mm -hmm. that covers it. But cosmetic surgery is strictly something that does not improve yeah. function. Of course, you might improve your quality of life because you're going to look good and mm -hmm. you're going to... You, know, you might get a promotion, <laughs> uh, you know, your marriage will, you know, your relationship yeah. will be sustainable, but, you know, it doesn't, it's not covered by insurance. Yes. Well, Collywood does uh, have a very uh, thriving um, plastics and reconstructive yeah. uh, surgery. And, you know, this is all new, because I remember back in 2008, when I started looking into plastic surgery to come into Ghana and help, at the time, Collywood had two plastic surgeons. Confonochi had three. Kolebu had two and a half. There was a Welsh surgeon who mm -hmm. used to come and help. And he's the one who will help him build the brain the brain's unit or the mm -hmm. brain center. You know, and now Ghana boasts about twelve plastic surgeons, which is good. You know, there are countries in Africa that don't have plastic surgeons. You know, Uganda has ten plastic surgeons, Kenya has about eight or ten, Togo doesn't have one, Gabon doesn't have one. Um, you know, and I, I can tell you this, that there are more plastic surgeons in a one mile radius in Beverly Hills than the whole continent of Africa. Wow. You know, it's interesting that um, there's been some improvement, which is a good thing. Um, what one or two things do you think we ought to do to um, create a situation where more and more people from across the sub-region and across Africa mm -hmm. We'll would plan. start looking at Ghana as a destination for either plastic surgery, constructive surgery, or healthcare, as we do South Africa at the moment. You know, it's hard to compare ourselves to South Africa in terms of uh, when it comes to plastic surgery. I know Dr. Um, the Johnson man who started the cardiac, you know, the heart surgery. Professor um, from Pom Pom. Okay. He did something that was very novel. Mm -hmm. Uh, was able to create and train plastic surgery in the sub-region and also attract patients here because there was not a single one. It was done really good, really well. Mm -hmm. So if you do it well, you know, I think that we still don't have the manpower to use it as a, as a, for tourism purposes, of course. And if those surgeons distinguish themselves, people will find them and come. You know, I have people coming to me in Beverly from all over the world. We have patients from China, from the UAE, from Saudi, most of my people are from Saudi Arabia, from Africa, from Europe, you know, from all over, you know, and it's, the body, it's your body of work. So if their body of work precedes them, yes, maybe that might, you know, that might uh, spark people looking into this area to come in for plastic surgery. I don't know how advanced the plastic surgeons here. Of course, I know a few plastic surgeons, one of them is Dr. Hoyt Williams, who is now you know, being appointed as the medical director for Restore. Mm -hmm. He's a plastic surgeon in Kumasi, and uh, I've had the privilege, uh, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege for me to be part of his journey mm -hmm. of becoming a plastic surgeon. He always tells me that he became a plastic surgeon because of me, because I came to Kumasi, we talked, and I talked to him, and he stuck around long enough now, he is uh, the chief of plastic surgery at CATH, okay? And of course, I still send him patients. When people cannot come see me in Beverly Hills and they say, hey, we can't come, I say, come to Ghana and come see him. Because I know his work. It's my reputation on the line. If I send a referral to a person I don't know and I don't know their work, that will affect my reputation. So, and I've sent him patients, you know. So, I think if we can, if they can distinguish themselves mm -hmm. to a point where they become visible on the world stage, people will come. Okay. Wonderful. Well, all too soon, we're at the end of our conversation, uh, and I know um, there's a whole lot more I wish we could talk about, uh, but I have five things I'm taking away from this conversation. Sure. For me, number one is that um, it's okay to dream. Um, there's always a defining moment in your life where um, you can start dreaming, and um, for Michael, it was seeing Operation Smile come and transform the life of a neighbor. Uh, number two is um, the life of grace, uh, as he puts it, um, didn't 
look like one of you know episodes of magic and uh, miracles but it was more because those opportunities presented themselves to a person who had a plan and was willing to keep working you know um, took a job he had planned he was going to work 20 hours a day um, took three jobs kept working uh, cut back but more importantly no matter where he found himself he always had something in him a skill a plan a desire to get to the next level so opportunities will come to you um, but they will only be useful if you are ready to uh, apply yourself and, and make good of them the third thing is um, the desire to want to give back um, you know that you can be inspired by someone but you must become an inspiration you must have a desire to pay it forward that someone helps you today you should help someone tomorrow uh, and create a virtuous cycle of giving that helps people um, change the world eventually the fourth thing is that we're more connected than we actually think um, if you look at Michael's story uh, people he's met uh, people who've directly impacted his life people he's uh, also impacted upon um, have all been because we meet and interact with each other and uh, you should never despise the power of the connection that you have with the next person they may open doors for you that you have no idea uh, was possible so um, we have a responsibility to be good to each other the final thing um, I am taking away from this conversation is that no matter where you find yourself whatever you desire to do do it to the fullest of your ability um, hone your skills in the direction that you want to um, pursue uh, but more importantly do it so well that the world will have difficulty ignoring you and that is how you would leave your legacy thank you once again michael thank it's you. been a pleasure thank you, sure. it's been a blessing and uh, thank you to the team uh, my producer and uh, crew and also to you for watching we'll be back again with more on the executive lounge as always go forward make great shalom something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. But one of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam.